Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a lively crew. You must have had plenty of coffee this morning. Amen. Coffee and the Holy Ghost. It's a great combination. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be here. It's an honor to be with you. And uh, your pastoral leadership couple are such a blessing in my life. And I'm grateful to have known them through these years. Um, your, your wife is, was one of my students. And I feel that the check today should indicate what she's worth to you. No, I, I mean, that's reasonable, right? <laughs> well, uh, good morning. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me say to you, as you leave, uh, there is a, a product table in the lobby, and some of my books are there. I want to tell you about the books uh, just briefly. Uh, your pastor mentioned the New York Times bestseller. This is the book that made the New York Times bestseller list. This is called Relaunch. It's a book really about leadership and turnaround leadership in particular, if each of you would go out there and buy a thousand copies each, you can put it back on the New York Times bestseller list. But, but uh, I think you would like it. You would enjoy it. This uh, book has uh, been selling for years and years. It's called Character Matters. It's a a chapter by chapter discussion of classical Christian virtues. This book uh, is about. It's called The Courage to Be Healed. It is not about physical healing. Certainly, we believe in physical healing. We pray for the sick and anoint them. But this is about emotional healing. It's my observation after 50 years in the ministry that the healing of damaged emotions is much more complicated than the healing of damaged bodies. And the variable is usually not faith, but courage. So I hope that you will consider this. And then uh, this is my uh, newest book, of kings and prophets. It's going very, very well. It's a discussion of the conflict between supernatural authority and secular power. And I use the, the laboratory of the interaction between the Old Testament prophets and the kings they confronted. It's going very well and I hope you'll enjoy it. But this is the book I wanted to mention, David the Great. This book has been a huge seller for us and continues to sell. Uh, it's the life and leadership of King David. And one reason it's gone so great is because we touched a market that is very, Christian book publishers will tell you it's very difficult to get men to buy and read Christian books. Women buy it, they love it, but we've got men to buy this book. Regardless of what some of you ladies think, some men can read. And <laughs> we started to put pictures in this one. We, But uh, this book has gone great. This, uh, it's no reason. Why, why wouldn't men love to read about David? He was a man's man. He was a tough guy, warrior's warrior. He's the kind of guy you want to take deer hunting with you. You might not want him to take your wife deer hunting. Um, but uh, we deal with that. I deal with that in this book. This is not your sanitized Sunday school version. This is not little David play on your harp. This deals with a complex, complicated, and I believe profoundly conflicted genius. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy the book and that it will be a blessing to you. It doesn't matter to you to hear this. It matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny from any book I've ever sold, hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide. I don't take anything I never have. It all goes 100%. Uh, my honorarium here at this church, the tuition from the NICL, all of that goes 100% to support our girls' homes in Southeast Asia and West Africa. So, so I hope you'll go out there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> this little guy right here is Ronnie Brennan, my associate, and he will be meeting you at the book table. Now, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, in the Old Testament to the book of Zechariah. And unfortunately, infrequently read uh, book, uh, one of the minor prophets, 
In fact, it is so infrequently read, I see people leafing through their pages. If you go to Genesis and turn right, you're going to be a while. So go to Matthew and turn left and drive slowly um, or you'll thumb right through it. But it is a powerful little book. Zechariah has a tremendous messianic prophecies and magnificent language. The, the Hebrew in Zechariah is powerful and great images. I want to read from uh, Zechariah 4, 6 following. I'm reading from KJV this morning. Uh, oddly enough, one of the verses in this is inexplicably translated differently in some of the modern translations. I want to zero in on verse 7, and you'll see it when they put it on the screen, which ends with grace, grace. But some of the modern translations translate it, God bless it. And I, I, mean, I can see that, that to grace something is to bless it, but the more powerful and more poignant translation is KJV. So we'll read from King James. Zechariah 4, beginning with verse 6. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Pause a moment. Zerubbabel, the prince of restoration, an Old Testament type for Jesus. This is the, the prince of the restoration. Saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Pause again. Mountain in prophetic writing may mean all kinds of things. What it almost never means is mountain. It can mean a power, an agency of government, a force of some kind, an army perhaps. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. Here's the revised Rutland translation. Who do you think you are? Geopolitical forces of the present age. Who do you think you are? Kings and tyrants and governments. When Jesus shows up, you'll be as flat as a tortilla. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Doesn't that sound like the New Testament? He who hath begun a good work in you shall also complete it, perform it, finish it. Now put your hands, if you will, on your Bible, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments, I pray that your spirit will brush aside every barrier to divine communication, rush in over the threshold of our souls, and enter in by your might into the inner person of every person here, those in the other campuses and those online, that at the end of this service today, we will say one to another, surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong son of God, amen. Amen and amen. I'm, uh, I'm the product of a very odd family. Uh, I was raised in an odd family. I see a good many young people here today. I have a prophecy for you that uh, when you are my age, you'll look back and realize how odd your family was. <laughs> but um, I, my father moved frequently. Uh, he, we were never unemployed. We didn't live out of the boot of a car or something, but he was just a, a vagabond. We just moved constantly. I went to four schools in the first grade, and I went to 25 schools before I graduated from high school. So we just moved all the time. Furthermore, uh, my parents were absolutely brilliant, both uneducated formally. Uh, my mother was a ninth grade dropout with probably as high a native IQ as anyone I've ever met. My mother never finished the ninth grade, but she believed if one could read, one could learn anything. And so my mother, uh, whenever we'd move into a new town, my mother would go to the library with a plastic laundry hamper and just fill it up with books. And she'd come home and distribute them. And uh, she'd say, we'll discuss this at the dinner table on Thursday night. Or, uh, well, I'll expect your report on this. And you couldn't cheat because my mother would read them all. And uh, she, she just believed in the power of words. And uh, we weren't Christians. Uh, I wasn't raised in a particularly Christian family. It wasn't an evil family. My dad, if you'd have asked my dad if he was a Christian, he would have said, of course I am. I voted for Eisenhower twice. But... <laughs> 
But he, uh, we didn't have um, Christianese. We went to some Methodist church somewhere two or three times a year. But uh, we, didn't, weren't, we didn't have family devotions. We didn't have a family Bible. What we had was a family dictionary, a massive Webster's Collegiate. And occasionally, my mother would open that Webster's Collegiate, and like a racing form, she would just put her finger, and whatever word it landed on, we had to learn that word. And I used the word learn advisedly. We had to learn the meaning, its definition, its synonyms, its antonyms, its etymology. We had to constantly learn these words, how to use it in a sentence. I deeply resented these dictionary devotionals. I have a friend who told me that he was raised with a drug problem. He was drugged to church. He was drugged to Sunday school. He was drugged to night church. And what happens with those kids a lot of times is that they, they begin to say to themselves, when I'm out of this home, I'll never, go, I'll never go back to church again. But that's not what happens. Instead, when they have children, they raise them with a drug problem. They take them to Sunday school and church and night church. I can remember sitting in those dictionary sessions and thinking, when I'm out of this house, I'm going to become an illiterate. <laughs> but instead, what it leaves one with is a deep appreciation for words. And we're, when, when a society suffers the loss or corruption or diminution of its functional vocabulary, it loses to one extent or another its ability to think because we think in words. So what can happen is that a society can, can uh, feel things deeply, emotionally, but can't express it, and, and all that emotion, it turns into, into anxiety and even violence. I can give you an example. The little fifth grade boy who thinks the brown-eyed girl next to him is the cutest number he's ever seen and wants to tell her that, and wants to ask her to be his girlfriend, but he can't think of the words, so he punches her in the mouth. <laughs> that can happen to a whole society. When a word shifts in meaning, it, it has some level of tragedy attached. And, and with the acceleration of technology, that happens faster and faster. Again, I prophesy to the young people. I prophesy to you when you're my age that there will be words that you use. You may still use them, but they won't mean the same thing. I, I'm probably the oldest person in the room, but I wonder if there's anybody here that remembers when gay meant happy. <laughs> I want gay back. Who stole gay? When I was a kid, I used to go to a party. I'd come home. My mother would say, did you have a good time? I said, yes, everybody there was gay. She wasn't worried. We were just happy. What about the Christmas song? We sing it all the time, don we now our gay apparel? That doesn't mean Christmas and drag. It just means we're happy at the birth of Christ. I went to preach recently in California, which is evidently where the English language will be destroyed. And it was a high school audience. And I, I, I never preached to a group that was so enthused about the message from the moment I started. They were with it. And afterward, I was talking to some boys up at the front, and the first boy said, Dr. Rutland, you are one bad preacher. In my lifetime, bad has come to mean good. The second boy said, you're not just bad. He said, you're the baddest preacher I've ever heard. Baddest is not even a word in the English language. <laughs> the third boy said, you're not bad. He said, you are one sick dude. <laughs> one can only sense my level of personal affirmation. <laughs> the fourth boy, not content with these low altitude compliments, said, you are not bad, you're not sick. He said, you are the OG of crunk. <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> now, when that happens to any word, there is a level of tragedy attached. But when it happens to our functional biblical vocabulary, 
when it happens to the words with which we think about God and therefore talk to each other about God, our apprehension of who God is may be warped around our bad vocabulary. There's hardly a word to which that has happened more tragically than the word grace. Grace has come to be sloppy agape. You put enough of it on anything. It's like, may like Christian mayonnaise. It can make rancid ham taste good. What does grace really mean? How fascinating to me, and perhaps to you as well, that one of the most graphic images of grace in the entire Bible is here in the Old Testament. I tend to think of the Old Testament as being about law and the New Testament being about grace. But here is this image of grace and the use of the word grace in a powerful way here in this minor prophecy. The image is, is this. It is of us on one side of a mountain. And our Savior, Messiah Jesus, is on the other side. We know that we are saved. If there's any verse of Scripture that is sacrosanct in the evangelical world, it is surely that we are not saved by works but by grace, and that through faith that, that, that if God gave us the grace to be saved as a gift, the faith to get saved as a gift of grace. We know that. Our name is in the Lamb's book. If we were to die right now, we'd go to heaven. The problem is that we view that saving grace as an historical event, a moment in our time. My name is in the Lamb's book. My sins are under the blood. Now I've received grace. Now I turn and face this mountain. And Jesus retreats to the other side. And I have to move this mountain so that there would be a smooth place, a plain, if you will, where he can erect a temple, a tabernacle, where Moses said in Exodus, I will meet with you. So I want that face-to-face -face encounter. I want that intimacy with Jesus. But this mountain is in my way. So I turn from saving grace and take possession and responsibility for the mountain. I hammer at it. I chip at it. I try to do everything. I can't get over it. It's unassailable. I can't get around it. I can't get under it. And so finally, the frustration begins to build and build in my life. This mountain won't be moved. The mountain is different in everybody's life. It can be addiction or, or some kind of hurt or hate or unforgiveness or racial prejudice or fear, whatever it is, the mountain is different in everybody's life. But if I take possession of it, if I assume responsibility for moving this mountain, my frustration eventually builds and builds and builds. That's the point at which many people leave the church and the kingdom. Every, probably every one of you in here knows someone who says, I'll, I'll never go back to church, and they choose something that they're mad about. I don't like the preacher. I don't like the music. The drummer's so crazy, they have to lock him up in a glass box. Some, something. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, they, they have a twisted sense of idealism. I won't go to church with this mountain in my life. What happens is they stay home with the mountain in their lives. Others take a different approach. They drape the mountain in camouflage. They drag the mountain behind them like a ball and chain draped in camo, and they meet others coming across the parking lot of spirit-filled churches dragging theirs, and they enter into a mutually agreed-upon covenant of suspended disbelief. Do you see my mountain? Nay, brother, thou hast no mountain. What about you? No mountain there. Let's go to church. When in the spiritual realm over our heads, there may be a veritable sierra of unresolved conflict. Others, and thank God it's most of us, fall at the foot of the mountain and cry out to Jesus on the other side. Lord, are you over there? Because this sucker won't budge. And I quit. Do you hear me over there? I quit. What we think is that from the other side of the mountain, we'll get a tongue lashing because we have fastened onto Jesus the face, voice, and personality of our high school football coach. So we think he'll yell at us, you big fat sissy. 
If you can't play with pain, you can't play on the Jesus team. Pull your socks up and hit that mountain again. So our frustration builds, our feeling of disillusionment with Jesus builds, and our anger as a result increases. And it creates a level of angry, frustrated Christianity. I'm not saying they won't go to heaven when they die. They will. They're saved. If they died right now, they'd go to heaven. But <laughs> the sooner, the better. Shoulder to the wheel, nose to the grindstone. This year, I'll be a Christian if it kills me. The only problem is what? It'll kill you. If it didn't put you right in a religious loony bin first, rocking back and forth in a straitjacket and humming, Jesus loves me. Because you'll never move that mountain. So we cry out, Lord, I quit. But instead of the voice of our football coach, from the other side of the mountain comes words we never thought we'd hear. Good. That's what I've been waiting on was for you to quit. Now stand back. And it says Jesus shouts. And what does he shout? Do better. Follow the rules. Obey the law. That's not what he shouts. In fact, he doesn't shout at us at all. He shouts at the mountain. And what does he shout? Grace, grace. And the mountain melts like wax. The liberal humanist will tell you that grace means God doesn't care about the mountain. That he winks and says, well, boys will be boys. But that condemns us to the destructiveness of the mountain in our lives. The legalist, the holiness legalist will tell you that grace means God will finally make you strong enough to uproot the mountain. But that condemns you to failure and frustration because it tells you right here, it's not by might nor by power. Grace, biblical grace means God wants those mountains out of our lives but he wants to remove them himself. He wants to grace them out. Our job is to surrender the mountain. While we take possession of the mountain, while we own it to ourselves, it creates this angry and frustrated brand of Christianity. Can I coin a phrase? It is disgraceful. We disgrace others because we are disgraced ourselves. We are ungraced. Graceless Christianity can create graceless churches, graceless families. So we, we disgrace each other. Sometimes they're disgraceful churches. We disgrace our pastors, criticize them and nitpick. I, I, I pastored a huge church in Orlando, 8,000 members. And after a service one Sunday, I went out to the lobby to shake hands, and this man came up. He was so angry, he could hardly talk. He said, well, I'm leaving the church. I said, why? He said, because of the lie that you told in the pulpit this morning. I said, what lie? He said, you talked about a certain battle that happened in World War I, and you said that battle happened in 1917. He said, I happen to be something of an expert in American military history. And I know that battle didn't happen until early 1918. He said, a man that will lie about a thing like that will lie about anything. And I won't go to church where there's a liar in the pulpit. I said, well, bye. <laughs> no, I mean, adios. I cannot fix that for you. That is disgraceful. But let me tell you about another man in the same church, a wonderful man, still my friend after all these years, an attorney in that church. After every sermon I ever preached, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we had Sunday night church. We were Christians in those days. Sunday morning, <laughs> Sunday night, Wednesday night, every sermon I preached, he would come up to me and he'd say, oh, pastor, it's the greatest sermon I ever heard in my life. Now, look, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. I know at a cognitive level that nobody can preach the definitive Christian masterpiece three times a week, year after year after year. I know that, but I like that lawyer lying to me. When I came out of the pulpit, I was looking for that lawyer. I wanted some grace. I know what you're thinking. 
We cannot do that for Pastor Rusty. If we, if we pump him, oh, his ego, we'll pump him. Go ahead and pump. There'll be some mean old lady in the lobby with a pen. She'll pop him. <laughs> After a half a century in the ministry, I'm now convinced that the entire, the entire race of Christians is actually divided into only two tribes, pumpers and poppers. I believe God is looking for an entire church of pumpers on which to pour his grace and blessings. We not only disgrace our churches and our pastors, we disgrace our own families. We disgrace our own families. I was the president of a university in the Midwest, and one, one day a man came to see me in my office and he said, I want to talk to you about my son. Well, I have thousands of students. I didn't know them all. But he named this guy. I said, oh, I know him. I know your son. He's a leader in the university. Or he's a Christian light on this campus. And he said, I know, I know. That's not why I'm here. I said, well, why are you here? He said, it's that earring. He said, I hate that earring. He said, I've asked him and asked him and asked him. You won't take that earring out. And I want you to make him take it out. I wanted to say, you had him 18 years. <laughs> I've had him three semesters. Why is this my job? But I felt he was not in a place emotionally to overcome that issue. Next day, I called the boy in my office. I said, do you know who was here yesterday? He said, oh, yes. And I know why he was here. He wants you to make me take this earring out. I said, son, your dad is a piece of work. He said, oh, he said, it stands between us all the time. He said, it's so stupid, President Rutland. I said, it is stupid. He said, to let an earring stand between you and somebody you love. I said, isn't that juvenile? He said, an earring, to let an earring hinder a meaningful relationship. I said, oh, that's so stupid. He said, it is stupid. Oh, he said, I know what you're doing. I said, look, son, one of you is going to have to be an adult, and I met your dad. <laughs> he said, you're right. I, I, I never thought about it from that point of view. He said, I just always put it on him. He said, you're right. I'm letting this earring stand between my dad and me. I've never been so proud of a kid in my life. He took that earring out of his ear and laid it on my coffee table, and he said, my father will never see that earring again. That's grace. That's grace. We not only disgrace our churches, we disgrace our families griping and criticizing. We, we disgrace ourselves. That's the most disgraceful thing of all. We, we judge ourselves. We look into the full-length mirror of self-evaluation and we loathe what we see. We say, look at you. Whence cometh this fat? <laughs> and where did your hair go? <laughs> Over superficial issues, we judge ourselves. Over sins, we live in condemnation that's been washed away. We, we doubt the grace of God. Look, I'm not trying to run your people off, but you realize this is, this is not real Christianity. You realize this is church. I, I've never committed a really venal sin in church. You, you realize that, right? Real Christianity is a cold Tuesday in January when you rush out to go to work running late and you slam your hand in the door of your truck. That's real. That's where you find out the level of your Christianity. You can say, oh, I'm getting a lawyer. Ford Motor Company's going down. <laughs> or you can blame yourself. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. <laughs> or more likely, blame God. Well, you've done it to me again. This is what I've come to expect. Or... You can lift that mangled paw aloft and say, grace be unto thee. Grant yourself the grace to be real. Life is real. Life is earnest. Grace will make you get through it. Yeah. 
So let me bring this to a conclusion here. What if, what if somebody came in this morning and didn't, didn't know anything about Christianity? Nothing. And they said, tell us, tell us about who God is and what God is like. And we said, oh, here's a Bible. Take this, take this home and read it. And he begins to read. And he reads the promises and he begins to read about the prophets. And, and then he comes to the New Testament. He reads about Jesus and the signs and wonders and miracles. And he reads the epistles and he reads about the, the love of God. But then he comes to the last line of the Bible. He comes, the last thing anybody says to you is important. I've been doing a little study on it. I don't know if I'll ever write anything on it, but it's interesting. Famous last words is fascinating. John Wilkes Booth that murdered Abraham Lincoln when he was wounded by the federal troops that arrested him and he lay dying on the porch of a farmhouse. He lifted his hand up in front of his face and he said, useless, and he died. I don't want my last word to be useless. John Wesley, as he lay dying, people around the bed weeping and crying, John Wesley said, somebody, please sing a hymn. He said, the best part is God is with us, and he died. What about God's last word? What if you got to the end of the whole Bible and faith is building, hope is building in you, and you got to the last line of the Bible and it said, I'm just tricking you. I hate the bunch of you. Is it just me? Or would that be a little discouraging? Or what if it says, all right, forget all the promises. Some of you are going to hell, some of you are going to heaven, and I'm not going to tell you the basis on which I choose. That turns, that turns Christianity into a dice game. You're lucky or you're not lucky. But that's not how the Bible ends. You come to the end of the entire Bible, and God says, look, I've been saying this from the Garden of Eden, and you just can't hear me. I said it through the prophets. I said it through the law. I said it through my son. I said it through the apostolic community. I've said it on every page of the New Testament, and here's my last word on the subject. I'm going to say it one more time. And the whole Bible ends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All the way, all the time, whoever you are, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, for the forgiveness of sins. Yes, for salvation. If you have never received the grace of God for the salvation of your soul, do that this morning. Say, Lord, I receive your grace. Save me. Write my name in your book. Cover my sins with your blood. I receive your grace. But that's not the end of grace. That's the beginning of grace. Then grace for life. God, give me grace for my marriage. Give me grace to raise teenagers. Oh, God, please. Give me grace. Give me grace when the last one of the little brats is out of the house. I mean, our wonderful children. Give me grace for old age. Give me grace for sickness. Give me grace to die and come to heaven. It's grace all the way. It's not just grace to make you a Christian. The great hymn, Amazing Grace. We sing it, but we think it's only about salvation. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Yes, it is grace for salvation. But then, Dr. Newton says, "'Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." Then he gets an eternal perspective, and he says, "'When we've been in heaven 10,000 years, and our righteousness comes forth as the noonday sun, we'll still be singing about grace, and it'll still be amazing. Hear the word of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, all the way, all the time.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you will, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this precious church, for its ministry in the community, and for its ministry today in this place, at the campuses, and those who are viewing through the media. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to open my eyes. If you would say, Dr. Rutland, will you please pray for me? I need grace for my sins. I need to know that the grace of God covers my sins. I want to be born again. I want to receive that. I'm going to pray with you right where you are. I'm not going to call you to the front of the church. I'm going to pray with you where you are. But you say, for me, the issue of grace is simple. I need grace for my sins. I want to be born again. If that's you, then you lift your hand up right where you are, and I want to pray with you right where you are. Yes, yes. One, two, three, four, five. There's another. Raise your hand up high. The lights are bright. Yes, yes. I see a couple there. That's wonderful. And there's another. There's a whole family in a row, all holding hands, raising their hands. Isn't that wonderful? Thank God. Thank God. There's another. There's another young lady over here and a man right over there, almost from the front row to the back row. All right, sister, I see you now back there on my left. Who else? Raise your hand. Way on the back row, all the way to the right. Praise God. Praise God. And right here in front of me, right straight in front of me. All right, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. In fact, why don't we all pray it? Why don't we all pray it? Pray with me right out loud. Will you please? Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned, but I know Jesus died in my place. I ask you now, wash me in his blood. Write my name in the book of life, and I receive your grace for salvation. And from this moment on, I will walk in grace and faith. Now I know if I were to die right now, I'd be in heaven with you. Now take your hands down, but keep your eyes closed. Others that would say, Dr. Rutland, will you pray for me? I don't know where it happened. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. If I were to die, I'd be in heaven.